The short story, Thank You, Mum, by the prolific African-American poet, novelist, short story writer and social activist Langston Hughes, appeared in his 1963 collection, Something in Common and Other Stories. Hughes was a leading figure in a cultural movement that spanned the 1920s and 1930s, known as the Harlem Renaissance. Named after the African-American neighbourhood in New York City where it was centred, it was instrumental in a revival of African-American music, dance, art, fashion, literature, theatre and politics, with its defiant rejection of the stereotypes and tropes that had been imposed by a dominant white culture. And we can still see this influence in his later work. Raised by his maternal grandmother, who instilled in him a strong sense of racial pride, Hughes largely focused on the real lives of working-class African Americans, and his work celebrates a neglected and downtrodden population. Hughes himself, quoted in Arnold Rampersad's 1988 biography, explained the purpose behind his work. My seeking has been to explain and illuminate the Negro condition in America and obliquely, or indirectly, that of all humankind. The extremely brief story, Thank You Ma'am, takes place very late one night, over the course of about an hour. The indomitable Mrs Luella Bates Washington Jones, who has a character just as imposing as her name, is walking back alone to her rooming house after a late shift working in a hotel beauty shop when her handbag is snatched by a teenage boy named Roger. The attempted robbery is foiled, however, when Roger loses his balance and falls to the ground. Mrs Jones wastes no time in retaliating and she soon has the somewhat weedy teenager in a headlock. Rather than drag him to the police station to answer charges, however, she frog marches him back to her lodgings, where she makes him wash his face and shares her dinner with him. As the two talk, we find out that even though Roger has nobody at home to cook for him, surprisingly he hasn't tried to steal her bag so that he can buy food, but so that he can acquire a luxury fashion item, a pair of blue suede shoes. Mrs Jones continues to surprise not only Roger, but also the reader, as instead of lecturing him on the errors of his ways, she shows him empathy and compassion, revealing that when she was young, she too wanted things for which she didn't have enough money, and she alludes to the fact that she may also have committed criminal acts. When they have finished their meal, Mrs Jones ushers Roger to the door, and, with no strings attached, presents the bewildered boy with $10, the equivalent of $100 today, so that he can buy the shoes for himself without having to resort to criminality to do so. The relationship is over almost as soon as it has begun, with Mrs Jones only hoping, in return, that Roger will no longer steal, and Roger so stunned that he is not even able to say thank you, ma'am, which is what he so desperately wants to do even as the front door closes firmly in his face. Hughes utilises an objective third-person narrator to tell his story. In other words, the third-person narration is reported by a seemingly neutral observer who has extremely limited access to the thoughts and feelings of the characters he is describing. Any exposition is provided to the reader via dialogue, whether through direct or reported speech. For example, we don't even know what the characters are called until they introduce themselves. Not only are they strangers to each other, but also to the reader and, it seems, even to the narrator himself, who offers no commentary on the events that he recounts. It is, therefore, up to the reader to deduce the two characters' motivations and backstories for themselves, and to infer the message or moral that Hughes is attempting to communicate. The style of narration allows Hughes to teach the reader a lesson without seeming to be overly moralistic or preachy. 
In this briefest of stories, Hughes refuses to fall back on lazy stereotypes and tropes to elicit easy pity and sympathy from the reader, and does not allow either of his protagonists to be defined by who they are or the circumstances in which they find themselves. Roger is not your run-of-the-mill hardened, artful dodger who has become accustomed to a life of crime in order to survive, and Mrs Jones is neither a passive, helpless female nor an adult who has forgotten what it is to be young. In very few words, Hughes is able to create three-dimensional characters who are individuals in their own right. In making Roger's motivation for the theft a pair of fashionable shoes, he gives him in one single stroke hopes and desires beyond what is put on the table to eat that evening. And in making Mrs Jones unafraid to stand up for herself physically and having her allude to a somewhat chequered past, he gives her an edge. In showing us that just one individual and their single act of kindness and understanding, rather than judgment and desire for retribution, can have a massive positive impact on another individual's life, Hughes smashes prevailing stereotypes of African Americans poverty and intergenerational conflict and touches on a huge number of themes such as forgiveness and second chances, altruism, generosity and dignity in poverty, trust, responsibility and integrity and crime, punishment and rehabilitation and through these seeks to communicate that that which connects us is far greater than that which divides us. The title, Thank You Mum, alludes to the story's final lines and suggests that this is going to be a tale with gratitude at its very heart, signalling that Roger will gain far more than a stolen handbag would ever have given him, as he learns from Mrs Jones's small act of kindness to him that we don't need to let our circumstances dictate our actions or define who we are. Hughes uses the first paragraph to swiftly set up the situation which will form the basis of the two protagonists' interaction. The story begins with a striking description of a large woman with a large purse, with a long strap, that had everything in it but a hammer and nails, which she carried slung across her shoulder. Hughes's use of hyperbole in the very first sentence to suggest that the bag is bursting at the seams with all manner of different items gives the reader an early impression of a strong and capable woman who is ready for anything. We quickly learn that it is about 11 o'clock at night, dark, and that she was walking alone when, with absolutely no warning, a boy ran up behind her and tried to snatch her purse. Note how Hughes's tone is dispassionate as he simply recounts a series of events without any attempt to make them dramatic. As the strap broke with a sudden single tug the boy gave it from behind, meaning that his weight and the weight of the purse combined caused him to lose his balance. Unable to take off full blast as he had hoped, the boy instead falls on his back on the sidewalk with his legs in the air. The woman, however, takes the assault in her stride. Rather than scream or fall to the ground herself, she simply turned around and kicked him right square in his blue jean sitter. In other words, she gives him a good solid kick up the backside before reaching down, picking him up by his shirt front and shaking him until his teeth rattled. It seems that the boy has completely misjudged his victim and the tables have been definitively turned. Note how the woman is now in complete control of the situation and how she doesn't react in the manner that we would probably expect. Rather than snatching back her property herself, she makes a symbolic point as she orders him to pick up my pocketbook boy and give it here, so that he can begin to make restitution for the harm he has done by restoring to her what is rightfully hers. When she point blank asks him, what did you want to do it for? The boy predictably tries to squirm out of it by claiming that he didn't aim to. She is not as naive as he is clearly hoping her to be and is not fooled by his disingenuousness for one minute, 
calling out his blatant and rather feeble lie for what it is. Note how now when she asks him if he'll run if she turns him loose, he simply answers that he will. The way in which he seems compelled to speak honestly to the woman, even though it is clearly not in his best interest to do so if he wishes to escape without punishment, not only communicates to the reader that she is a force with which to be reckoned, but also makes us realise that the boy is not some hardened, streetwise criminal, but a naive and impressionable child who has bitten off a lot more than he can chew. The woman's initial reaction to this attempted street robbery sets our expectations up that she will punish him, especially when she declares that she won't turn him loose and she brushes his whispered apology aside with a curt and disbelieving mm-hmm. Surely she is going to announce her intention to frog-march him to the nearest police station. Her next words, however, seem to come out of the blue. Your face is dirty. I've got a great mind to wash your face for you. Ain't you got nobody home to tell you to wash your face? When the boy responds in the negative, she makes good on her threat. Then it will get washed this evening, said the large woman, starting up the street, dragging the frightened boy behind her. Instead of to the police station to answer charges of attempted street robbery then, it seems that she is prepared to take the boy, who has just assaulted her, into her own home to sort out his dubious personal hygiene. Hughes now provides a description of the boy who looked as if he were 14 or 15, frail and willow wild in tennis shoes and blue jeans. Lanky and weak, he is no physical match for the large woman. What she says now, however, is even more surprising. You ought to be my son. I would teach you right from wrong. Least I can do right now is to wash your face. Are you hungry? Her words, particularly the modal verb ought and the phrase least I can do, reveal that counterintuitively she feels responsible for him, even though it is he who has assaulted her. And her inquiry as to whether he is hungry seems to be early evidence that she is an empathetic and compassionate woman, even if the boy is as yet unaware of it. He is still of the opinion that she has some painful punishment in mind as he fruitlessly tells her that all he wants is to be turned loose. The woman, however, has other ideas as she lets him know, in no uncertain terms, that he's brought this all on himself by bothering her in the first place and that he'll have to suffer the consequences for his poor choices. Was I bothering you when I turned that corner? asked the woman. When he responds in the negative, she fires back, that you put yourself in contact with me. If you think that that contact is not going to last a while, you've got another thought coming. When I get through with you, sir, you are going to remember Mrs Luella Bates Washington Jones. This threat clearly sends a chill down the boy's spine as sweat popped out on his face and he began to struggle, although this is to no avail, as all Mrs Jones needs to do is stop, jerk him around in front of her, put a half Nelson about his neck and continue to drag him up the street. They finally reach their destination, which is Mrs Jones's home in a multiple occupancy building. From her type of accommodation, a large kitchenette furnished room, which we would call a bedsit in the UK, and from which the boy can hear other rumours laughing and talking down the hall, she is evidently not very well off herself. Once Mrs Jones has ascertained that the boy's name is Roger, she orders him to wash his face in the sink and only then lets go of him. Free at last, Roger looked at the door, looked at the woman, looked at the door, and went to the sink. Hughes's use of italics here to provide emphasis suggests that even the narrator is shocked at Roger's unexpected behaviour. What is it that stops Roger running when he gets the opportunity? As Roger bends over the sink, he asks Mrs Jones if she is going to take him to jail. Mrs Jones, who clearly holds personal hygiene close to her heart, tells him with a sniff that she wouldn't take him anywhere, not even to jail, with a dirty face like that. But we can tell that her bark is worse than her bite, as her complaint that his actions interrupted her journey home to get her dinner soon turns into an inquiry as to whether he himself has had anything to eat. Here I am trying to get home to cook me a bite to eat, and you snatch my pocketbook. 
Maybe you ain't been to your supper either, late as it be, have you? Roger's response that there's nobody home at my house, the second time that we've been made aware of this, not only tells us that he hasn't had any dinner, but also suggests that he has a chaotic home life with very little parenting and no positive role models to teach him how to behave properly or to show him care. Mrs Jones responds to this by declaring that the pair of them shall eat together as I believe you're hungry, or been hungry, to try to snatch my pocketbook. What Roger says next is just as surprising. The reason for the bungled street robbery is not because he is starving hungry and wants to be able to buy life's essentials, but because he wants a pair of blue suede shoes. In other words, a luxury fashion item, immortalised in the song, first by Carl Perkins and then by Elvis Presley. Surely Mrs Jones, not to mention the reader, will now lose any sympathy that they may have had for him. Won't she now take him to the police station after all, or at the very least send him packing with a flea in his ear? To the readers, and no doubt Roger's surprise too, she does neither. After she has berated him for trying to take something that wasn't his to take, she drops the bombshell. You could have asked me. Roger can't believe his ears and stands there just looking at her the water dripping from his face. In the ensuing silence, and after he has dried his face several times just for something to do, he considers his options as he eyes the open door. He could make a dash for it down the hall. He could run, 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 run. There's something about Mrs Jones, however, that stops him. Mrs Jones finally breaks the silence, somewhat cryptically remarking, I were young once and I wanted things I could not get. Roger is clearly expecting this to be the preamble to a lecture on the sins of stealing and his shock when it doesn't come is evident on his face. There was another long pause. The boy's mouth opened. Then he frowned, not knowing that he frowned. Mrs Jones is waiting for this before she continues. Mm-hmm. You thought I was going to say but, didn't you? You thought I was going to say but I didn't snatch people's pocketbooks. Well, I wasn't going to say that. Pause. Silence. I have done things too, which I would not tell you, son. Neither tell God if he didn't already know. And echoing the title of the short story collection itself, she says, Everybody's got something in common. So you sit down while I fix her something to eat. You might run that comb through your hair so you will look presentable. In other words, she's saying that none of us can claim to be free from sin and that she understands him a lot better than he thinks she does because she has been in a similar situation herself. Note how Mrs Jones now puts all her trust into Roger as she gets up and goes behind a screen where there is a gas plate and an ice box or refrigerator, leaving the young boy with a clear escape route. The woman did not watch the boy to see if he was going to run now, nor did she watch her purse, which she left behind her on the daybed. Roger, however, responds positively to this test of trust, going as far as to sit on the far side of the room, away from the purse, where he thought she could easily see him out of the corner of her eye if she wanted to. He did not trust the woman not to trust him, and he did not want to be mistrusted now. Roger is now desperate to show Mrs Jones that he can be trusted, even to leave the house on an errand as he offers to go to the store for her if she needs some milk or something. Note how Mrs Jones casually puts the responsibility for Roger's behaviour back onto him, giving him an out if he really wants one, by responding that she doesn't believe she needs anything unless you just want some sweet milk for yourself. I was going to make cocoa out of this canned milk I got here. The two begin to eat, and Mrs Jones once more shows her sensitivity and empathy as she does not put any pressure on Roger to provide an account of himself. The woman did not ask the boy anything about where he lived, or his folks, or anything else that would embarrass him. Instead, as they ate, she told him about her job in a hotel beauty shop that stayed open late, what the work was like, and how all kinds of women came in and out, blondes, redheads, and Spanish. When they have finished their ham and beans, she cuts the cake that she bought for herself in half and shares it with him, kindly encouraging him to eat some more, son. The biggest surprise is left for the end of the story as, when they were finished eating, she got up and said, Now here, take this ten dollars and buy yourself some blue suede shoes. 
And next time, do not make the mistake of latching onto my pocketbook, nor anybody else's, because shoes got by devilish ways will burn your feet. The very last thing that she says to him is, Good night. Behave yourself, boy. Roger is so dumbfounded at her unexpected generosity that he is unable to speak. The boy wanted to say something other than thank you, ma'am, to Mrs Luella Bates Washington Jones, but although his lips moved, he couldn't even say that as he turned at the foot of the barren stoop and looked up at the large woman in the door. The reader is left with a sense that Roger is feeling gratitude for more than the gift of the ten dollars. Mrs Jones has treated him firmly but fairly, with compassion and kindness. Rather than judge him for attempting to steal from her for what is fundamentally a non-essential item, she shows empathy by seeing beyond the stereotypical criminal to the young, neglected child that he actually is, who has his own hopes and dreams. Note how her fixation on the cleaning of the dirt from his face suggests that she sees his sin as something superficial that, rather than defining who he is, is something that can be washed away. Instead of lecturing and punishing him, she teaches him that respectful and responsible behaviour is a two-way street. Her leaving of the door open teaches him that rather than being forced to do the right thing, one can choose to. By giving him a large sum of money that she can clearly ill afford herself, she embodies her belief that your circumstances should neither dictate your actions nor rob you of your humanity. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.